what I, I try and focus on is help people with their visibility, help people help them step into whatever their authentic brand is, Ooh. be more confident in the way that they show up. And then the, the flip side of that is monetization because you can't get paid for being famous. There needs to be a business. <laughs> you know how sometimes people can take the personality of their name, like Usain Bolt is really fast. Bob Gentle is just like that. Not because necessarily the guy is gentle, just because he is an easygoing soul, and I loved talking to him. He's from way across the pond in Glasgow. He has his own podcast, Personal Brand Entrepreneur Show. Amplif AmplifyMe.agency is his website. This guy not only helps you kind of figure out the quote-unquote authentic you, but how to bring it to life, how to get more clients doing it. It's a fantastic listen, so dial in and... Let's go. Do more by doing less. With me, Charles Alexander, for small business owners, startups, and busy folks. So I came across you from Andy Storch, correct? Yes. I like that dude. Andy's a very good friend. I've known him probably eight years now. How did you get to know Andy? He came across to London to a conference that I was at, and... It just gradually grew from there. So he's in a mastermind with me now. Got you. So I see Andy, oh, I don't know, every every two weeks or something. Y'all meet y'all meet twice a month in that mastermind? Yeah. In looking at what you do, not to oversimplify it, but been to your website, listen to the podcast. It's a pretty simple concept. You're helping folks like me brand themselves as not just, well, brand themselves and be able to help them to put them in a position of authority and gain more clients. It's kind of like that. Yeah. I mean, I, I kind of struggle with the word branding sure. because it, it, it kind of smacks of something synthetic. What I, I try and focus on is help people with their visibility, help people, help them step into whatever their authentic brand is, Ooh. be more confident in the way that they show up. And then the, the flip side of that is monetization because you can't get paid for being famous there needs to be a business <laughs> unless so, you're a kardashian yeah well even then they don't get paid for being famous they have to actually hustle to do the deals you don't see that in the background true story they all are uh, billionaires but they have a million different lines each too mm. i love the way you you just stated that yeah uh, when you're talking about an authentic brand when everybody really got into personal branding and i know it's been around forever but Literally, it felt like it went full hockey stick takeoff, I don't know, a decade ago. And everybody suddenly rebranded themselves on Twitter and Instagram and everywhere else. And everybody became a hashtag hiking enthusiast, outdoors individual, travel foodie. And like, man, I've known you for a while. I mean, the biggest foodie thing I've seen you do is supersize it over at McDonald's. How do you, how do you go about helping people to become show their authentic brand i know authentic's become a word that's i don't know it not i won't even say overused because it's the right word but how do you help somebody that's a, a coach an advisor an agent to do that well i have a framework for that but Ooh, to like simplify it, it just it begins with actually helping people see themselves in the way that they they should be able to see themselves a lot of the time we've become accustomed to seeing ourselves often in a slightly negative light from a human mm -hmm. biology perspective. There's no survival benefit to seeing your, your plus side, your good side. There's only right. a survival benefit to seeing the areas you need to improve. It begins with, I guess, me getting to know people, getting to see what it is that actually is magical about them. What do people genuinely value about them? What is their zone of genius? Mm -hmm. is that on the one side. And then on the other side, A, who do they feel called to serve? But also this zone of genius that we've uncovered, who does that most benefit? How could they take that to market, if you like, in a way that they enjoy, mm -hmm. is profitable, and is actually bringing something good into the world, ideally, most of the time. It's quite, it's quite tricky, but I think everybody, and I'll... I'll yeah, I'll die on that hill. Everybody is unique. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Everybody is valuable to somebody. And it's just how do you tie the line between what it is that you have that's valuable and the person who needs that 
if you can tell that story repetitively enough in a way that triggers people's imagination and allows you to own some real estate in the mind of a, a growing audience, for me, that's about how you build a personal brand. Well, if I'm taking a step back and looking at this, and I love the way you point out that we only see the negative because, and I keep going back to it, despite whatever your belief system is, if the world's been around 6 billion years, 6,000 years, whatever religion or non-religion, it's always kind of the same concept. We're on the outlook for saber tooth tigers, not wanting to get kicked out of the tribe or wanting to fit in or not not wanting to create any more problems. That's what our brain is. Thousands and thousands of thoughts a day. Most are repetitive. And then even most of those are negative. What would, what are you telling people when you're working with them or even when you're just doling out advice like you are now, how do you tell them to identify what their authentic piece of the puzzle is, the positive parts, the zone of genius? What are you telling them to do to look for that? Well, one piece of advice I got, because I, I used to really struggle with personal visibility. People who mm. know me now as the 2024 Bob, they find this hilarious. <laughs> I, I'm actually a very self-conscious person. I'm a screaming introvert. For me, building my personal brand was something that I had to do in order to serve the people that I wanted to do. Because where I used to live was a very rural area. There weren't enough people that I knew in my local area that would allow me to do the kind of work that I wanted to do. It was the kind right. of business where people say, Hey, could you walk my dog? If you want to eat, you're going to have to say yes. Yeah. I knew if I wanted to play a different game, it was going to have to be online. I was going to have to grow. That's the first part of it is people are going to have to accept they're going to need to grow. And one piece of advice that I had was keep a compliment journal. And compliment thought, journal. You know what? that sounds really narcissistic but it's actually really powerful and it helps extremely quickly because people say nice things about us all the time. They do. But we filter it out. But if you stop filtering it out and you actually, by, by having a place where you have to write this down, I had one notebook. Its only job was to capture compliments. Once you have that notebook, it signals to the unconscious, this stuff matters. And so it comes to the surface all the time. Yeah. And that then allows you to recognize, well, what, there are things about me that I'd never considered were assets. Mm -hmm. There's another aspect to this, which is when you start showing up online, people start commenting on qualities that you'd never considered. Really? Until I started my podcast, which was about four or five years ago, nobody mm -hmm. had ever mentioned my voice as an asset. When I started the podcast, people started coming back to me saying, your, your voice is amazing. I thought, yeah. Really? Cool voice, Bob. Never have considered that. Hmm. We all have these hidden assets that until mm -hmm. we actually start using them, we'd never have known about. And I think there was one other point I was going to mention. It's terrible. There's one thing about being a podcast guest, which is different <laughs> from being a host, which is you can't write down what it is you wanted to say. Well, that's why I'm happy. Hey, and I'm terrible about that. Anybody that watches this, I feel sorry for them because I'm constantly looking down, taking notes for that very reason. And I'm supposed to be looking at the camera. You were on a roll. You were telling us about Bob's introvert in order to see the good things in himself, in order to find his zone of genius. Because that's what I'm asking you. How does somebody find what they're good at or what other people yeah. compliment them on? And you're telling me they're having to capture it. They're having to write it down. Bob's an introvert, but Bob wanted to help other people. And if he's an introvert, walking dogs in rural Glasgow, he can't help other people. He had to do it in order to get out and serve others. So I like to use the analogy of the hero's journey. Ooh. If anybody's sitting there thinking, well, I don't know what my zone of genius is. I don't know what it is that makes me special. Start moving because it's in the moving that you discover. Take action. Just start with one thing, what it is you think you want to do and as you begin building your personal brand, building an audience, stretching yourself, testing yourself, you'll, you'll, you'll refine what it is that you're doing over time. And this is where I could come back to the analogy of the hero's journey. When I began my personal branding journey, if you like, yeah, I was running a digital marketing business. What I do now is markedly different. Yeah, it is. But if I hadn't started moving on that journey, I would never have gone through this process of self-discovery. And this is an important part of it is don't assume that what it is that's your true zone of genius, but just start moving anyway, because you need to go through the process of discovery. Pick something now, but don't think that's going to be it forever. 
I couldn't tell you the number of people that <clears throat> I've worked with as clients or that listen or watch. They may be a financial advisor. They manage other people's portfolios, but then they move toward speaking and writing because they realize, especially that we have to do some of the stuff online now in order to attract clients that they were good at it. And people invited them to do that. And that added another, not just source of revenue, but that added another way that they can touch or help other people. Or like you said, you got coaches that might've just always done group coaching or individual coaching. And then they, they realize you might be a flip side of that is also true. And they, there was a certain aspect of business that they now create frameworks and they sell those and they, that's their whole thing. Forever. I've been one-on-one -on -one business coaching and I created an explainer video business. Cause I like the stories, the, the hero's journey, like you were talking about. And then over the past year, I went, even wrote a book on how to start a business, but then I've completely moved over to helping people to create a four day work week in 90 days or less. That's not a personal plug. Actually it is. The reason I bring that up is because I was going through this exact same process. I'm listening to my business coach at, at, at our church. We did a find your calling for four week process. And in their case, they're trying to help us find our calling there for church. But in that case, it's like, man, I, I need to be helping people figure out how to do what I've done. Following your framework is what I inadvertently did. And it, it's awesome. I think what I'd really like is that idea of finding your calling. And there's a hidden secret there that if, if you want to find your calling, you need to start listening. What's calling? Because most of us aren't paying attention, really. We're, we're, we're in survival mode most of the time. Yep. We're hustling. But if you listen to that whisper that says, you could be doing this. You're not mm -hmm. going to be able to do this necessarily right now, all in. Yeah. But you can start listening and you can start playing and you can start experimenting and growing. There's another part to this, which is there's whatever you're doing right now and wherever you are in business right now, you have to do what's in front of you. You have to do what you have to do in order to eat. Most people have to. Right. Eat. But the reason I love the idea of personal branding, and it's not just about personal branding, but it's about amplifying that personal brand. It's about right. lots of people right. knowing yeah. because with audience comes opportunity. And if a lot of people know who you are and what you do, you have more opportunities to spend more time doing the things that you love. And you can start saying no to those aspects of your business that you don't necessarily love. Mm. And over time, it's a little bit like turning an oil tanker. Suddenly you find you're in a very different direction. You can't do that all at once. It takes a long time to turn an mm -hmm. oil tanker. But if you're not gently nudging the, what do you call it? The tiller? I guess the rudder. Yeah, the rudder. Actually nudging the, the rudder, direction is never going to change. You end up in the place you never really planned being. It was just the line of least resistance. And that makes Bob sad. Don't make Bob sad. The uh, example I've always heard is that we all think we're a tugboat, the big thing that pulls the giant ship, but we're not tugboats necessarily. In some cases, we can make those quick transitions and changes, but in other cases where we want to do more of what we want to do, we've got to start making little little Im implementations now. So going back to your framework, and if somebody's started figuring out, all right, that, that I'm, I'm doing this, but I really want to do X, Y, and Z instead, in order to start moving toward doing that, you're telling them, go ahead and start making those personal branding changes now and don't expect it to be an overnight success. This is me leading into a leading question I wanted to ask you about. Even if nobody were to ever listen to this, I'm going to get all I can out of it. Cause I know you've been, like you just said, you started podcasting four or five years ago and you're big on, I think it sounds like helping some of your clients get into podcasting and not just podcasting, but podcast guesting as an actual source of meeting and networking. And I only started mine, gosh, just less than a year ago. I wish I'd have started it four or five years ago. Cause that's when I started talking about it. And if I'd have done that, I'd be where Bob is now. And I'm not got the cool haircut, but that's it. Why should somebody, let's say podcast guesting, that's easier to start than podcasting. Why should somebody do start doing podcast guesting once they get some of that framework figured out? Podcast guesting, we'll start with podcast guesting. It's, you're known, you're judged by the company you keep. If we were to take a really brutal, what do you call this? Mercenary approach to sure. building a personal brand. We're judged by the company we keep. If I post on LinkedIn or Instagram or Facebook, here's a screenshot of me hanging out with Charlie Alexander. That's right. People are going to think, hey, 
well, it must be a bit of a big deal hanging out with that yeah, fancy American. Yeah. And that they'll, they'll put that to one side. It happens again a couple of weeks later. Hey, look at this Bob hanging out with Mark Schaefer. Wow, that's pretty cool. Sure. This repeats again and again and again over a period of years. They start to put me in the big deal box. There's just an, an automatic impulse. And what that's doing is over time, it's, it's working with the neurology of the people who actually know us. Sure. And I give you a great example of how that can work over time. There was a guy maybe 15 years ago, I pitched to build a website because that was my business back then Yeah. for an HR company, human resources, don't know what you would call them in the US, probably something similar. And they were the biggest in town and I didn't get the work. And I got the distinct impression that the guy who ran the company really didn't like me. A couple of years ago, I get a call from a guy, the same guy. He's now the CEO of the local enterprise agency, which is a big deal. This is the, the organization that supports small business across the whole region. Sure. And he said, Bob, you're the only person who can help me. Ooh. He had completely changed his own narrative about me. Yeah, you didn't have to do it. Why? Well, because he did this drip, drip, drip of uh, perception over time completely true. transformed who he thought I was. That's one aspect of it. Yeah. Another aspect is you and I are speaking now. Mm -hmm. After this call, I'm probably going to ask you to tell me about your business. And then I'm somebody who takes relationships very seriously. I help people wherever I can. And if I see somebody who fits your ideal client profile, you can guarantee you're going to get an email introduction. Um, again, that aggregates up over time. Yeah. And networks are very powerful. And if you look at how my business has changed over the last three years, really, where previously my business, and this is a good way of measuring it, was 95% UK, not even... 95% Scotland, not even UK. And now my business is probably only 30% Scotland. The rest of it's worldwide. And my business remains predominantly driven through referral. It's just my relationships and my network have completely changed. Yeah. Um, similarly, because I regularly shop talking about what I do specifically and people get to know me before I ever meet them, by the time people come to me, they've already decided they like me. They know what is what it is I do very specifically. I don't really have to pitch. I haven't written a proposal for three years. Wow. I send people an email saying, I would love to work with you. Here's a payment link. That's it. It's a good deal, Bob. Yeah. So there's that. Yeah. But there's some more. Your search engine marketing profile, if you can imagine, if you're somebody who has a website, and you're regularly showing up on other people's podcasts, every time you do that, there's a very good chance that they're going to put a page on their website about that episode. On that page, there's probably going to be a link back to your website. Aggregate that up over 50 to 100 appearances over time. That creates a substantial inbound link profile for your website, which any SEO expert will tell you, you can't buy. It's very powerful. And then... There's the support network. If I, I, I know through my podcast, A, as a podcaster, but B, also as a podcast guest, most of the world's experts in anything to do with digital marketing, online sales. If I have a question, I don't have to go through expensive processes to get answers. I just call my friends and I have the answers. Yeah. And often they'll do the work for me for free. Don't tell them I said that. Sure. But also what goes around comes around. I'm a very generous person. Too. Yeah, you are. That's the long answer to a short question. I well, no, that, that's four, I mean, five great points there. You're talking about the first and foremost is the authority of it. And now go back to, I guess, the original question is I've had people that I've worked with. So the concept of the podcast and what I do, helping people do more by doing less. One of the things that everybody gets frustrated with is constantly trying to drive in new leads, drive in new revenue, drive in more clicks and we don't want to have to do it in a way that feels sleazy spammy or not authentic we just want to be we just want to hang out be cool do what we love talk about what 
things we we're passionate about and then hope everybody comes and finds us. That's not an overnight process. You've got to, if you want to start building that brand, you have to start doing it now and you have to guess. And, and there's not a right number unless Bob tells me it's 48, which would be great because then I would immediately start working on the number, but there's not an exact number. You might have to do this months, who knows, maybe a year or two to start getting in that drip. But once you do it, you've built that authority like Bob is talking about. I've been lucky with just even hosting my own podcast where I've gotten people that I've read their books, made notes in their books, and then invited them to be on it. And lo and behold, they did. And it's only because I sent them a video of somebody else that was cooler than me, so to speak. I'm going to send everybody, once they find out I've got Bob on here, I'm going to flip out. I'm going to go get everyone because they're like, Charles got Bob. But that that does work. And then the bigger aspect, even more than, to me, the, out of all of it, what you mentioned is the networking aspect. I can tell you again, I've, the people I've met just hosting my own, much less guesting somewhere else, it is huge. I've got a network now of individuals who are, we're all special, but they're all like a league or three ahead of yeah. me. And if I have a question, I've got a, a personal branding question. I know I can shoot Bob a quick email and he'll fire back. And hopefully he'll like me enough in the future that if he has a time management or delegation or a batching issue, he'll shoot it to me. And I'll, like, here's what you do, Bob. And, th and that works really well. That goes into the support network and the, then the networking aspect of it as well. Bob, how do, so let's say somebody buys into that they're bought into the all right i'll do i'll do i'll bust my butt and get get on one a week for the next year i'll be 52 in grand how do i do that well it's actually really easy i don't so you your podcast is relatively new you've been doing it for a while now you probably hit the point now where people start sending you pitch emails agencies, oh my god because... <laughs> yes they do but how often do you get pitched by a potential guest directly? It's probably very rare. Rare. We get, what Bob is talking about is that, and I have no issue with this, but a lot of us like to hire a podcast booking agency and they'll charge you a hundred, two, 300 per episode to get on somewhere. And what they're doing, bless their hearts, they do a good job is that they say, we, we, we just love, and you can tell it's like big space, do more by doing less. It's almost like a bad audio dub. And then they, they don't know nothing about my podcast. And they'll tell me all about Bob and why he's a great fit. Even if he's not a great fit, Bob's a financial specialist teaching people how to flip houses. Like, oh, I get these yeah. multiple times every day and I glance at them and I hit delete. I've, I've got to the point where I don't even reply to them and say, no, thanks anymore. But if somebody messages me directly or emails me, they have my full attention because it's, it's that unusual. Uh, yeah. And I'll usually, unless there's a really good reason not to, I'll usually say yes. And I imagine I'm not that unusual. And what people need to remember is podcasts need guests. If it's a guest show, they need guests. If you make a reasonably respectful introduction, keep it kind of short and don't emotionally blackmail me, yeah, you'll probably get my full attention. <laughs> if you want to find out the contact details for a podcaster, it's usually pretty easy. You just look on the website. You'll find yeah. the content details. Yeah. And if you can't, there are databases you can subscribe to where you'll, where you'll get access to them. List of notes I found was a really, a really good one. Uh, it's not designed for you to go start spamming people, but previously I'd written a book on starting a business without quitting your full-time job and I was promoting it. And I just went on and found a lot of folks that are in the startup or career coaching mode. And the thing I found that worked for me at that point is to say, hey, Bob, just listen to your podcast. I loved this episode specifically would mention something in the episode and then send them like a real simple one pager. If this worked for you, I'm prepped, ready to go. Got your questions, got your bio. You don't have to do anything other than have me on and then send them a link where you've been on another podcast. That does mean you have to get on one first where they can hear that what you're talking about. And yeah, Bob, I'm, I agree with Bob. It was it was way better than when I had hired somebody else getting me on irrelevant podcasts, not to mention the cost of it. Yeah. But it has to be said in the spirit of the name of your podcast, the most highly leveraged possible activity. And yeah. I don't know if you've seen my personal brand business roadmap, the framework that I operate, but on that, that roadmap, yeah. podcasting kind of looks equal to everything else but it is the most highly leveraged activity 
for a bunch of different reasons. Number one, sales. If you ask anybody, what's their biggest problem in sales? That's I can never get a conversation. If you could design a podcast that's designed to facilitate conversations <clears> with <throat> potential A-list clients, you will rarely struggle with accessing your the people to speak to. Because instead of going out knocking on doors saying, please, will you speak to me about buying my product? Right. You'll go out to people and say, hey, I want to have you on my podcast and make you look awesome. If you make somebody look awesome on their podcast for 35, 40 minutes, sure. at the end of that interview, I guarantee they're going to say, hey, what is it you do? Well, I'm glad you asked. Yeah, I would always design a podcast with that in mind a little bit. Then there's another aspect of it, which is, your network. And I like to talk about the idea of the dream 100. Do it. Who are a hundred people who, if you knew them and they knew you and you were kind of friends, it could change your life. And this isn't just about networking, but this is about stretch networking. People you were never going to natu act naturally bump into. Sure. This, this is like, it must might be the Leonardo DiCaprio, the Snoop Dogg. Yeah, yeah. You're never going to bump into those. But through the power of intention, putting them on a list with a podcast, chip away, you'll be amazed what you can accomplish. And the, another aspect to this is the creator space is exceptionally generous and collaborative. And it's a little bit, I often use the Harry Potter world analogy that once you enter the magical world, people recognize each other. It's a small world and they really support each other. And once you have a podcast, it kind of gives you the keys to the magical kingdom you have something to trade with. That's a really powerful thing. If I have a podcast and you have a podcast, guaranteed, Charles, I'm going to say, hey, Pod Charles, you should come on my show too. Yeah. And this is how it works. Having a platform to trade with allows you to build relationships with speakers that run conferences, people with large communities. And if you want to build your expert brand, being seen as a a guest in other people's platforms on a regular basis, not just podcasts, is really powerful. And I guarantee you, if I get a pitch for somebody wanting to come on my podcast and I see they have a podcast, I need to find a reason to say no. Everybody just heard Bob invited me to be on his podcast. Woohoo! <laughs> the Dream Dream 100, God, that's something I came across. It's been a minute when I read Chet Holmes, The Ultimate Sales Machine. Cheesy, cheesy title, but way ahead of his time in terms of how to build your network and how to offer value. And I mean, just really tons of good stuff in that book. And none of it is written about social media whatsoever because it was written before then. I think Russell Brunson since then has taken it to a whole new level, but the concept's real simple. Write down a list of a hundred people that you would like to work with, talk to people that are just they're not necessarily in your circle, but just a little bit out of the circles. If I'm trying to uh, Seth Go, he he shares similar similar traits with us if i'm trying to reach seth godin i'm i'm reaching within my circle of trying to find uh, other people that have done that and i've had people on my podcast that had seth on there so that gives me a little bit of leverage to start trying to do that and the purpose of it isn't to just uh, uh mooch off somebody else that's got a higher ranking but to be able to get into contact with them so you can start reaching new audiences and helping more people because that's the only reason you're doing what you do, period, is so you can help other people. Well, there's another part to this as well, which is we all have the same issues when it comes to building our personal brand and taking ourselves seriously. Imposter syndrome is way more common than people realize. Mm -hmm. It's pretty universal. As a, a friend of mine did an academic study on imposter syndrome and found that 80% or something like that of high achievers experience it on a daily basis. Similarly, comparison, we all compare ourselves with other people and we only ever compare those ourselves with those people that we perceive as ahead rather than behind. Correct. And there's a whole other swathe of uh, emotional and, and mental uh, bear traps for us to fall sure. into when we're trying to grow. But when you've got people that you look at as mentors and role models telling you what you're really good, it has a big impact on you and it happens all the time, but only if you put yourself in the situation where you're regularly having conversations with these people and it changes how you feel about yourself. And once you change how you feel about yourself, you can show up differently and it becomes a self-perpetuating sure. journey of growth. 
That's, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's an excellent w way to frame that. All too often, we just get in our own little little bubble, little, I don't know, we, we join a Facebook group of one, and everybody in that group is mean to us, and we, we don't take, a, take the time to kind of look at what everybody else thinks of us and some of those positive traits. Start wrapping, wrapping up where we are. What are some... You've given given us a lot to think about, building your brand, how to try to start looking for what you should be doing or transition more to it. We talked a lot about podcasting. Are there some easier, lower hanging fruit ways to kind of not be, maybe not even sell, but to make, make more of those, you know, to sell, to make more connections like that? I think truthfully, I come from a marketing background. Yeah. And as somebody who comes from a marketing background, it frustrated the pants off me. <laughs> it didn't seem to matter how much marketing you did. The sales team would just sit quietly and do very little. Sure. And whenever most organizations, and I say solopreneur businesses are exactly the same, whenever they want more customers, instead of looking to sales processes, they look at marketing. Like if I can only shake this tree a little bit harder, maybe the fruit will fall out yeah. rather than getting a ladder and climbing. Although I put a lot of emphasis into building and marketing personal brands, the companion work to that is helping people build a sales process and becoming a little bit more courageous about starting conversations with strangers. If we take something like email marketing or email list building, which people sure. will be familiar with the idea of email list building. Yeah. Most people let these email addresses trick, drop, drop into a basket and they look at them and they admire them. Look at my email list growing and they mm -hmm. might send out an email. But do they look and see who are these people? Do they connect with them on LinkedIn? Do they just subsequently cheer on what those people are doing, build a relationship with those people on LinkedIn and then say, hey, I saw you did this thing. It was awesome. And that will probably re lead to reciprocating conversations where people think, say, what? Nobody's done that before. And nobody's paid attention to me for a second. And I've noticed what you're doing too. And I'd really like to speak to you about that. Wow. It's so simple. Um, simply using our existing networks to start conversations by trying to be valuable first. Sure. Um, there's a funny psychological phenomena where if I was to meet you in a room and I said, Charles, your shoes look wonderful today. You're hardwired to look for something just nice to say about me. That's how the we law of reciprocation. Yeah. You can use that within a social setting to trigger conversations where people feel like they need to reciprocate. They need to talk to you. And it's just by going onto social media with an attitude of generosity, quite authentically, sure. spending 20 minutes a day, trying to change somebody's world, that will come back to you. It's a very simple sales process. So, by the way, love that. That, And most of the time we don't do that. We're just DMing, and I'm bad about this, DMing and inviting people to something that I'm offering value, but I'm not taking the time to say, hey, Bob, I love that long sleeve blue and green plaid shirt. It looks cozy. By the way, it does. Bob, We'll do a quick transition here. What's, what's your favorite book or what is a, uh, a book that you've read recently that you, you'd like to tell us about? Well, I feel really late to the party on this, but I, I'm a productivity guy. Yeah. And I've used all the systems. And I remember probably 10 years ago, there was a guy in my office he was keeping this funny little journal. And I thought, what sure. the hell is he doing? This looked really complicated. <laughs> and, weird. and I just stumbled across a book called The Burnt Bullet Journal Method. And it has completely changed the game for me. What's uh, the name of it? It's called One Second. Tell me. For those of you listening, Bob's got a cool library behind him. And I think it's he's cool. got a Commodore 64 back there. Probably back to front. It's called the Bullet Journal Method. Track your Bullet past, journal. order your present, and plan your future by a guy yeah. called Ryan Carroll. Yeah. And it's all about going super analog with your productivity. And I've been working with mm. this for a month. It's so good. It's so refreshing, so liberating. And what I love about it is it's not just about 
the productivity, but it's also the where the awareness and the intentionality that you bring to to it. So that's been really good for me. I've really enjoyed that. I do love going analog to kind of get yourself focused. So Bob was telling me, folks, before we hopped on here, he's already down to a four day work week. So congratulations to him. And to wrap up, I always ask everyone the same question, Bob. So in being a productivity guy like you are, what is something right now that you really think you should personally or professionally be doing less of? I'm a people pleaser. And one big problem I have with clients is when I see a problem and I can fix it, I jump in and fix it because I'm sure. a technical guy as well. Yeah, but I find myself offering to do so many things that I shouldn't. <laughs> so for me, it's just becoming better at saying no internally. Bye. Obviously, I wouldn't do that externally. Sure, Bob's over there connecting people's Zapier to uh, Active Campaign and Google Drive for them. <laughs> oh, all the time. If you quit doing all of the people pleasing, which I highly recommend, if you quit doing that, what will that let you do more of? Well, I think sales. Okay. I would really like to spend more time doing that because, I mean, I have enough clients. But the nice thing about sales is you can be, and this is, I would really like people to listen to this. If you're somebody who gets all of your work through referrals or content marketing or mm -hmm. things like that, you get what you get. That's it. The customers that come to you, they're what you get. But if you're intentional about outbound sales and actively going after the people you really want, you get to choose the customers. Oh, that's right. That's really cool. I want to spend more time on that where I can go after those people where I, where I see real alignment. Um, and well, alongside that, more content, content marketing, because I really enjoy it. Well, speaking of doing that, how, Bob, how does somebody how does somebody find you? Well, I am super easy to find. You find me on pretty much every social media platform except Truth Social. You will not find me there. <laughs> Just search at Bob Gentle or Bob Gentle anywhere you go. I'm really easy to find. My website is amplifyme.agency. Fantastic, Bob. Super cool to meet you today, my friend. And uh, you have a great rest of the evening. And you. Thank you very much for having me. Don't take off just yet. I've created a new program just for you, helping overworked entrepreneurs create their very own four day work week in 90 days or less. Look, if you'd rather spend more time with family, friends, traveling, exercising, having the time to do what you want instead of, I don't know, putting out never ending fires, tackling another to do list and checking email at 9 p.m., then go to my website, your Charles Alexander. Dot com. If you've created the income you want, but don't have the time freedom you deserve, then this is for you. And as always, if you don't, an angel may actually lose its wings. True story. Have a great day.